Uh, I'm Sarah, Sarah Posner, and this is The Posner Show, and my guest today is Israeli journalist Gershom Gorenberg. Um, the American audience uh, is probably familiar with his work. He's a columnist at The American Prospect and at Open Zion at The Daily Beast, and his most recent book, which um, I think is a essential read about uh, the situation in Israel and Palestine, is called The Unmaking of Israel. And it is now, if I'm not mistaken, out in paperback. That's correct. So, okay, well, today we're going to talk about the fallout and repercussions of the elections in Israel last week. And, um, but I just want to note that the day that we're taping this um, is also the day of Chuck Hagel's uh, confirmation hearings in front of the Senate uh, Armed Services Committee, where he's being grilled by some Republicans uh, about comments that he's made uh, about the quote-unquote Jewish lobby, or about Israel, or about um, the uh, the situation in uh, Israel and Palestine, and it seems interesting to me that these U.S. senators are so zeroed in on what Chuck Hagel thinks about Israel and trying to ferret out whether he's possibly anti-Israel. But I wonder, do Israelis even know or care uh, about what Chuck Hagel has said in the past about Israel? I don't think anybody outside of the inner circle of wonks uh, <laughs> has the foggiest idea uh, what Chuck Hagel has said in the past. Um, or anything about him except for maybe they may have noticed an item that he's a nominee to become uh, American Defense Secretary. Mm -hmm. um, but even among the upper percentile of knowledgeable Israelis, I wouldn't uh, embarrass them with a the test for that. <laughs> um, what, I, what I will say is that I haven't seen uh, any public, uh, com public comments, even off the record, record comments against him um, from Israeli sources, and there was a comment reported by the pretty hardline right-wing deputy foreign minister that he had no problem with Hegel. So I think this is one of those classic examples of, um, you know, American politicians being eight times more Catholic than the Pope when it comes to Israel. Sorry for mixing my religious metaphors. Oh, but. well, maybe we can just say eight times more pro-Israel than John Hagee. Well, <laughs> well, the problem is I don't want to put it that way because I don't think that those positions are particularly pro-Israel. <laughs> uh, air quotes on the pro-Israel. What? Air quotes, yes, air on, quotes the pro -Israel. on the pro-Israel. Yeah. Yes. So, okay, well, let's, let's, let's turn now to Israel um, and talk about the election. So last week, uh, the election were, was held, but um, I think that the process of the election is probably unfamiliar to Americans because of the parliamentary system there. Um, and so the process that has been started now, certain parties won a certain number of seats, and now the process that happens is to the forming of coalitions and the figuring out who gets what ministries and so forth. Right. Um, so where where does that process stand and how long do you think it's going to take to to for all of that to get figured out, all the horse trading to happen? Well, the process stands at the point that it's clear that uh, Benjamin Netanyahu uh, will be asked <clears throat> to form the next government to be the next prime minister. He has to create a parliamentary majority by creating a coalition with other parties in order to do so. Uh, and that process could take 10 minutes after he officially gets the job, or it could go on for weeks. Um, it's, it's really difficult to predict that in advance. Uh, what happened in the election is that uh, the side of the Knesset of the parliament made up of the right wing and ultra-Orthodox parties won a majority of one, <clears throat> 61 seats. So that guaranteed that that uh, Netanyahu would be the next prime minister, or would be asked to be the next prime minister. On the other hand, Netanyahu's Likud party sunk from 27 seats to 20 seats. His joint ticket with the Israel is our home uh, party headed by uh, uh, Avigdor Lieberman uh, went down from 
42 seats total to 31. Um, Netanyahu managed to get reelected while losing the election, essentially. There was a, right. a very significant drop off in support for his party and for the bloc as a whole. Uh, and what that means is that the business of putting together a coalition is much more difficult for him. He needs uh, several coalition partners to reach that magic number of 61. And each possible combination requires. Uh, pushing into the background one major problem or another between the key parties in the coalition to be. <clears throat> and On those, the one hand, okay, he, he can't form a coalition. Or, or, that's not precisely correct. He would have an extremely difficult time forming a coalition without uh, the centrist party, the new centrist party that's gotten a lot of attention right. since the election. Uh, led by former journalist Yair Lapid, mm -hmm. um, which has only one seat less than his party does in, in the parliament. <clears throat> um, the only way he could form a, a coalition without Lapid's party is to take in all of the right wing and all the orthodox parties and then have a majority of one in the, in the Knesset, which do you think that's uh, likely? he doesn't want to do because right. Netanyahu doesn't want to do that because he'll appear so. Uh, the coalition will appear so extreme and it will be so fragile because the moment one person walks out, it, it, it falls. Right. So he wants Lapid in. The problem is that um, it, for, for Netanyahu is that, first of all, Lapid's party is demanding some form of ending the draft exemption for the ultra-Orthodox, which the ultra-Orthodox parties object to vehemently. And there are all, it, Lapid's party is also demanding that Israel return to uh, peace negotiations with the Palestinians, uh, which at a very early point could cause a crisis for the other right-wing religious party known as Jewish Help. So it, it, they have to figure out how much they're going to paper over mm -hmm. in order to create a coalition. Well, let's and talk about whatever coalition they create uh, will be rickety. Well, let's talk about uh, Lapid for a minute, because I think that, or for more than a minute, <laughs> Um, because I think that here the election results were interpreted as, look at that, the right was vanquished and the center won uh, because Lapid kind of came out of nowhere. I think a lot of people were expecting based on the media coverage in the run up to the election that I think was based in part on polling that turned out to be inaccurate. A lot of people were expecting Naftali Bennett's party to make this huge surge and he was sort of like the next big figure on the right in Israel. And that didn't happen and so I think a lot of people were uh, looking at it as a great victory for a centrist party um, and that's um, Lapid's party, that there is a future. Um, and the question that keeps reverberating in my mind about that is, well, what is that future? Um, and is it a future that's the future that he proposes, is it doable given the configuration of the, the, the probable configuration of the Knesset? Well, first of all, I want to talk about the what happened in the election itself. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of, uh, you know, the victory of the center uh, uh, description uh, is based on previous expectations. Um, as you mentioned, there was an expectation that the right was going to have obviously a solid majority in the parliament, uh, probably a larger majority. That was the buzz beforehand than it did uh, in the outgoing parliament. Uh, it, Naftali Bennett's party was expected to do well. Uh, and so when the election came in virtually tied, that was the first surprise. Now, part of this was, in fact, based on the polling. And I think that the words inaccurate in poll are inseparably uh, joined in <laughs> Israel. Uh, there are a lot of intrinsic problems built into polling. And uh, so uh, in, you know, unless uh, Nate Silver wants to design a model eight times more complicated than what he's got for American polling, it's hard to count on those polls. The, okay. one, the one thing that was going on toward the end was a, a sign of a drop in support for the right and for Netanyahu. Uh, there's also a law in Israel that you can't publish polls 
within five days of the election. So what, what, whatever was happening in those last crucial days wasn't, uh, wasn't being reported, which mm -hmm. added to the surprise effect. Mm -hmm. um, the reality is that if you break the parliament up into the major blocks, <clears throat> um, the, center, the center parties actually have a little bit less uh, uh, support than they did in the outgoing parliament. Uh, Lapid's party plus the two seats that uh, uh, the shattered remains of Kadima received plus Tsipi Livni's six seats. Altogether, parties labeled as centrist have 27 seats. In the last Knesset, uh, Kadima by itself had 28. So basically, if you were just looking at the center, there's just been a rearrangement of, uh, of seats in the middle. Um, the only actual block in the Knesset which gained in this election, interestingly enough, was the uh, parties of the, of, of the left, uh, Labor and Merits, who, uh, who, who gained seats. Uh, not enough to, you know, take power, but that's where the electorate shifted to if you look at the overall picture. Uh, so that's a very significant fact, and that's what leaves Netanyahu so so weakened. What does Lapid stand for? Mm -hmm. a, as far as I can see right now, a interesting collection of very, very shallow statements, uh, many of which are designed to please everybody. Um, how those promises will play out once his party is in government is a question dependent not only on the coalition, but on the what the different members of his party understand its platform to be and whether they have any ability to govern. Uh, just to give you, you know, the most obvious example, uh, Lapid promised, insisted that Israel must return to negotiations with the Palestinians. He also says that Israel must hold on to the major settlement blocks, including the settlement of Ariel, which is fairly deep into the West Bank. Um, and his platform states that, uh, you know, repeats the narrative that the breakdown in negotiations is pretty much wholly uh, in, at fault, uh, that the Palestinians are almost wholly at fault with that. Well, this is an unrealistic combination right, of, right. of, of uh, positions. And it will be tested if, in fact, he succeeds in getting Israel to return to the negotiating table it will very quickly become clear, as it did to Ehud Olmert in 2008, uh, that you either have to move from that position or you aren't going to negotiate and you're not going to get to a peace agreement. But what would, would Lapid actually have the political power or clout behind him to actually press for that? I mean, so would he have to be given uh, the become foreign minister to be able to be in a position to do that? Or under what circumstances do you think he would even be placed in a position that that was even feasible, even assuming that his his theoretical positioning on this is feasible? Well, the position that he has to be on is basically saying this is a make or break issue for holding the parliament, to get, for holding the coalition together. The foreign minister in this, in, in historically in Israel has not been the cent uh, depending on who's in the office, uh, but has not always, in, I don't think in most of the instances, been the central figure in such negotiations. Um, it, relations with the United States and uh, peace negotiations, which are the most critical foreign policy issues uh, in Israel, are usually run out of the prime minister's office. Mm -hmm. So you could say Lapid has no influence over this and that he's just going to end up a uh, uh, providing a, a fig leaf for, uh, for Netanyahu that Israel will get an even more glib spokesman than Netanyahu and uh, Lapid will talk nice while Netanyahu fails to move. And that's what will happen unless uh, Lapid says uh, you have to negotiate seriously or we're walking out or we have to agree on who the key negotiator is, or uh, you send somebody from our a, 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 our choice of negotiator to the table. Um, 
unless he makes that a make or break condition, unless he's willing to walk out the moment that, uh, that Netanyahu uh, shows that he's not really interested in making any progress, mm -hmm. uh, he's not going to have any influence. Um, and if he's not willing to walk out, having the foreign ministry isn't going to help in the least. Okay. So, but what I'm hearing you say is that he really, he really has to stand firm, but his public statements so far on this issue, stand firm on walking out of the coalition if, if negotiations don't start again, but it seems like from his public statements that he's really not that committed to it because he's made these statements, statements that don't really hold together or are, are contradictory with each other. I would say, put it differently, I think he's expressed a commitment to contradictory stands. Um, he may be sincere about that. He may simply have uh, uh, taken the position that is most likely to appeal to the center of the Israeli electorate, which is polling of all sorts, uh, all sorts of questions has shown that there's a broad swath of the Israeli electorate in the middle who believe that you have to go back to negotiations and don't trust the Palestinians, that we have to make peace, but we can't divide Jerusalem or give up the major settlements. Um, <laughs> and they're conflicted. Mm -hmm. And Lapid managed to express their conflictedness perfectly in his election campaign. Well, if you were writing an editorial for Haaretz and you did that, or for the New York Times, that would be fine, right? But when you actually have to carry it out, you have to start choosing between, uh, between those positions. And so the test is, having gotten into government, right now, Lapid is saying that Lapid and the people in his party are saying they will not enter a government unless Netanyahu sets a date for when they're going back to the negotiating table. Okay, that's a good start. Once you go back to the negotiating table, you're going to sit down at the table and uh, uh, Mahmoud Abbas or his stand-in as a representative of, uh, of, the Palestinian is, of the Palestinians is going to say, we want a peace agreement uh, based on the 1967 borders with small one-to-one -one, uh, uh, exchanges of territory. We want to start where uh, Olmert left off in 2008, which means an internationalization of the old city, uh, that's what they're going to hear. And there is a partner for that deal. There is not a partner for the deal that is laid out in Lapid's, um, in Lapid's platform. Right. So, okay, that's what happens after elections, right? You know, you promise the world to everybody. Right. And then you and have to now you have to choose who to, who to disappoint. But how does that possibly hold together with a right-wing coalition? Ah, uh, that's a lovely question. <laughs> I, I, I really don't... If, if he stands up for that, and the moment that, that it requires any kind of action or public commitment, uh, for instance, the Jewish Home Party would either walk out or splinter. Right. Uh, because the Jewish Home Party is in itself a fusion of a right-wing and another much more right-wing, or at least somewhat more right-wing party. Um, every political party is a coalition within itself, and part of the Jewish Homes Coalition, uh, at least part of it, will not tolerate, say, any restriction on settlement building, um, even restriction to the settlements that Lapid thinks that Israel can keep. Um, it will not be, the, the, the hardliners in that party will not even be likely to allow a, a um, lip service to the idea of mm -hmm. a two-state solution. Right. Uh, so where, what happens if there's real negotiations? I don't know. I think that this is a, um, an interesting laboratory experiment and uh, that John Kerry should put on a white lab coat um, <laughs> and immediately step into the laboratory and, and run a test. Well, maybe with what, his, his what do you doctoral think? advisor, Barack Obama, uh, <laughs> in the in the lab with him. Well, but what do you think? What do you think they can do, Kerry and Obama? Well, Kerry if they think that 
they have to make a deal with this government and they think in American terms that this government is going to be there for four years. They're not going to get a deal with this government. But if they're thinking in terms of a, a fluid political situation, then there's much more that can be done because uh, a, a coalition collapsing could be seen as, as, as a good starting point rather than a good ending point. In other words, um, on a wider level, I think that one of the mistakes of American negotiations in the past has been a focus too tightly on officials and politicians without uh, paying attention to the fact that uh, it's public support for a process that is likely to make the greatest difference. Uh, so American diplomacy, first of all, has to address the, uh, the, the Israeli public as well as the politicians. And if there is a sense more widely that there's a real deal on the table, uh, that there's an actual chance of getting peace, um, well, I think that Netanyahu would have the choice of facing an electorate even less happy with him than, than, the, than, the la than last week. Than last week. Mm -hmm. or, or trying not to face that electorate by, make, electorate by making concessions. I, if, if there's one constitutional issue in Israel, which has no constitution, it's that I don't think that Netanyahu is constitutionally capable of making those concessions. So, okay, so the government would fall. All right. So, I mean, a, a, uh, from, an, from an Israeli let's, let's point of view. Let's say hypothetically that let's, that, let's that happened. Let's look at this differently. From an Israeli point of view, American politics look, looks very strange because <laughs> It's a league with only two teams in it, and each time they play a game, there's only one inning. Um, but Israeli politics doesn't work that way. So, but hypothetically, if, if this happened, and it seems, it seems difficult to imagine for me at this point, actually, that, that, this, that, that uh, the Obama administration would put that kind of pressure to, towards the negotiating table at all, um, but maybe I can be surprised. But let's hypothetically say that that happened and it did cause the government to fall. I mean, what do you think? Do you think that that would move the Israeli electorate to elect a government that was more committed to making peace? Or do you think the electorate is not there? Well, I, I think that, well, first of all, these are estimations. Yeah. I, I don't make predictions. Sure. Um, in, I think that last week we saw an election in which the Prime Minister ran unopposed, uh, did his best to squelch this issue, uh, and still, and, and the electorate still moved significantly leftward. Um, and I think this is in keeping with a wider pattern in Israeli politics that that the pendulum swings back and forth, as it has been doing since 1992. Um, and that the idea that the Israeli electorate as a whole is moving steadily rightward, that the ship is sinking on the right side, um, that that hypothesis it doesn't stand up either to a longer view of history over the last 20 years or to a shorter view of history over the last uh, 20 days. Well, well let's, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that that idea that the Israeli electorate has been moving in this right-wing direction is, is, is a proposition that is definitely out there and talked about, uh, you know, among American talking heads who cover this issue or, or write about this issue. Okay, so that's a one, that was a one election supposition. In 2009, the right won a, clear, a, a, a majority and Netanyahu took office. In 2006, Edward Olmert, a recovering right-winger, but, but now committed to the idea of an Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank, ran on a platform of Israeli withdrawal from the West Bank, and the center and left won a larger majority right. in, in the Knesset. Uh, the election before that, in 2003, Ariel Sharon, uh, taking a more hawkish line at that time, won the election. All right, in 1999, 
Ehud Barak uh, saying that he was negotiating peace won the election. If you call this a trend line, you, it's only by, by shortening the scope of vision to uh, such a brief period that, that you, can, you can squeeze a trend out of it. Well, I think, it's, it, I think that when you look at it, maybe not so much as a trend, but even as the short-term spurt, developments have been alarming, even as a short-term spurt from, you know, since 2009, um, you know, if you want to look at it in the whole scheme of things. So I think that to an outsider um, who sees stagnation in terms of the peace process, continuing building of settlements, um, and no, no possibility, you know, it doesn't seem that, that a withdrawal is at all in sight. And then you had over the past few years, you know, the very, um, you know, so the, the outlandish racist statements by somebody like Lieberman, um, the attacks on the left wing NGOs. And so to an outsider, you know, who's not thinking about it in terms of historical trend lines, but just looking at the more immediate events, the inclination is, wow, there's a real tilt to the right. But then you have Lapid winning, and then it's like, oh, well, maybe the, the right was not so much um, in control, and here's this center, and everybody loves the center because it sort of splits the difference. Uh, but no, it promises that you can have your cake and eat it too. And, it <laughs> and then that, not, none of that ever happens. Right. But but so I think that I think that for for Americans who watch this, you know, you watch it and you wonder, OK, so, um, you know, the right wingers seem seem to have, if not the upper hand, they have, you know, their their position is the one that's that's locked in right now, you know, no freezing of settlements and no withdrawals. Um, and so it's hard to see where, where the resistance to that is actually coming from. Okay. I, I would put it differently. In, there is a problem of inertia or of momentum. Mm -hmm. um, and in developments not in the parliament, but on the ground, mm -hmm. in terms of settlement building, in terms of settler support within key bureaucracies, uh, in terms of not negotiating, the momentum has been with the right. And so in order to change directions, you don't have to merely make a turn. You have to exert much more energy because the, the actual machinery of state has, has been it working uh, according to the rights program. And that change is desperately important and urgent because, uh, well, for one thing, a failure to negotiate could, uh, could uh, destroy Abbas's support among Palestinians, which is predicated on the idea that Palestinians can get a state through negotiations. So, um, in terms of those things, you're saying, well, let's look at the short term because the short term is really important because things could change quickly. Uh, that's true. Uh, in terms of the electoral situation, um, I, I don't think it's true that there's that there's a right wing drift. I think there's deep divisions, and mm -hmm. I think there's people, as I said, in the middle, who would prefer not to decide until they're pushed to. Right. Um, and I also think that. It, a concrete peace deal is much easier to support than an abstract one. Because what happens when, a, when the idea of two states and a peace deal is abstract is Israelis, or for that matter in a different constellation, Palestinians are told, this is very much what you have to give up and you might get something in return, but we're not quite sure what, okay? But when the thing that you're going to get is, is sharper and clearer, then it's easier to decide that you want to pay that price uh, because you're going to make other gains that are important to you. Mm -hmm. So uh, yes, the question is whether uh, there's a push for negotiations. And mm -hmm. there's, uh, you know, 
uh, three or four possible, let's say three and a half possible directions that that push can come from. Either a boss can find some way to to launch a new public initiative with international support saying, yes, you know, Mr. Netanyahu, I see you have a new government and that you're de dedicated to returning to negotiations. I want to come to the Knesset tomorrow to, you know, explain why we should make peace now. That's that's one approach. Uh, second thing that could push negotiations, as I said before, is Lapid's party really sticking to it, uh, saying, we want to sit down now, we want to do what's necessary. If not, you know, we're flying high, we're willing to face the electorate again on that. Um, a third possibility is that, as on other issues, where Obama has seemed uh, more assertive in his second term, uh, than we learn to expect in his first term. It's true. On domestic issues here, he has been. Okay. So, you know, his foreign policy team is being approved. Now, I think, I, I would guess the results of these elections were also a surprise uh, in the top foreign policy circles in the United States, uh, unless they had some secret poster out there who was, you know, giving them different, I, I highly doubt it. Yeah. And so they have a new situation. Yeah. They have to decide whether, given the new constellation, given Netanyahu's internal weakness and his dependence on Lapid, whether it's worth launching an initiative. And right. if they do so, they uh, could alter the state of things. And the half is that there's been talk of, uh, of Europe uh, engaging in such an initiative. The, the reason I say half is that, first of all, Europe's internal problems are far more complex than, than American domestic issues. And second of all, even though Europe is, is Israel's biggest trading partner, um, its uh, diplomatic clout is, is smaller here. But that's also a possibility. So if one of those three and a half things happen, Netanyahu <laughs> gets tested. If not, he can keep a coalition together uh, on that issue. That's before we get to the issue of drafting the ultra orthodox. Right. I mean, there is there is that issue. That's another that's another big issue that could pull a coalition apart. And Lapid is for drafting the ultra orthodox into the into the military. Is that right? He's got this program which uh, is aimed at cre at bringing the ultra orthodox into a universal draft. Uh, he his his platform says that what would happen is that. Everybody 18 years old uh, would have to report to the draft office. The army would then decide how many of them it, it needed, and everybody else would have to do some sort of alternative civilian service. Uh, there's a lot of practical and uh, problems with that. Um, there's a question in principle of whether drafting people for, for civilian service is um, as justifiable in a democratic system as drafting people for military service. Uh, but the biggest question is, uh, can you put together a coalition which will support such a program? Um, in, in, or if, if Netanyahu is not leaning on Jewish Elm to put together his coalition, then he needs the support of the ultra-Orthodox, at least the larger ultra-Orthodox party Shas. And, um, you know, can somebody, I don't know, you know, come up with the grand compromise that will, that will um, either solve or paper over that problem? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know? Well, talk to me after you get done with the debt issue in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> well, let's talk about the uh, Israeli left. So there's a there's a new think tank, a relatively new think tank, Molad, mm -hmm. uh, in Israel. And one of their, I don't know what his position is, one of their analysts, Avner Inbar, mm -hmm. wrote, a P, wrote an ele election analysis um, in which he says that there really is no center and that the left is thriving and that, they're, that Molad's public opinion polling, which you, I don't know if that counts, is, is in the realm of the unreliable public opinion polling shows that there's you know a good chunk of israelis who are very left-wing on if i don't know on economic issues i don't know on on uh two-state solution um 
I mean, I know you've read the piece. What do you think? Well, I think, first of all, that um, the analysis is um, a strong one. When I said that polling is, is innately inaccurate in Israel, I'm really referring to electoral polling uh -huh, because, okay. for, for, for instance, one thing that happens in an Israeli electoral poll is you ask people who they're voting for and they say they're undecided, but they're undecided between 15 parties. <laughs> and the reason that they're undecided be in this last election could very easily have been that they're undecided between four or five different parties on the center and the left, but they're going to vote and they're going to vote for one of those parties. So. If you assume that the undecideds don't count, you get everything wrong, okay? There is a pattern of polling which shows that a strong majority of the Israeli public wants to go back to negotiations. There's a pattern of polling that shows that a large part of the people who want to go back to negotiations don't believe that they're going to succeed. Logically, that's not a consistent position, mm -hmm. but based on experience and conditions, sometimes people believe contradictory things until they're, they have to make a decision. Um, but the, the basic idea that Malad's report is presenting, which is the shift, actually, the, the people who gained from this last election were on the left. Uh, I've already said, I think that that's true. Um, I, they're, you know, the centrist position is, uh, is, has something basically untenable about it. Uh, but it is reasonable to presume that anybody who didn't want to go back to negotiations uh, would have had a hard time voting for Lapid. So uh, more support has, has, has swung toward that position. Uh, it is not a time for wringing of hands and for despair. And I think that that's you know the bottom line point that 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 comes out of that analysis. And so, you're not wringing your hands or despairing. No, well, first of all, I think that that uh, you know I think one of the reasons that you know to go back to your question is is Obama going to do this? I think one of the reasons for the atmosphere of despair about Middle East negotiations in in Washington is that despair lets you off the hook. Right? Mm -hmm. This disease is terminal. We can't do anything about it. You know, so stop trying new things. Well, to, in addition to, to that, it it lets you off the hook of getting into the whole discussion or flame war about whether you're pro-Israel or not. Right? <laughs> that's the that's the litmus test here. Uh, you know, for Chuck Hagel or uh, you know any politician. They all have to set, you know, they all have to demonstrate that they're pro-Israel. And so if you're despairing, then you don't even have to, like, enter the waters to, um, you know, if you're a politician. Well, if you take a particular kind of despair, which is, is um, it, the brand of despair sold by the Israeli right, which is there's no point in going back to negotiations because there's nobody to talk to. Um, um, that is, uh, well, you know, the, the and, despair, and for the Israeli the right... That's a pra that's a a, a, um, that's not despair, a point though. of ideology it dressed up as a practical problem. You right. Know, I mean, that's the way they it. want it to be, and so they right. We don't want to go back to negotiations, so it's easier, it's nicer right. to say in public that there's not, nobody to talk to. And in a sense, they're right for the kind of agreement that they'd be willing to make. There's no partner. Right. For but the problem is that the kind of agreement that, that they want to make is a problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, for a, a, quote, Palestinian state, unquote, that's a bunch of little enclaves with, uh, with limited powers and, and having to go through tunnels to get from one section to the next, and Israel controlling its borders, yeah, okay, there's no partner for that. Right. So if that's your, your bottom line, you can stand up and say there's no partner to talk to. And if you don't want to upset this uh, extremely vocal, um, you know, if you don't want to worry about getting labeled that you're not pro-Israel in Washington, apparently it's easier to take that position. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it would be healthy to even say pro-Israel position 
uh, that actually has Israel's um, best interests in mind and not uh, uh, showing how hawkish you can be. Right, right. But I don't think, I mean, I think that the, I think a lot of people viewed the Hegel nomination as being a baby step, a real baby step in that direction, or in my view, I mean, I think some people may have seen it as uh, more than a baby step in that direction, that it was like a real test of whether, um, you know, a Democratic appointee would stand up to these charges of being anti-Israel um, launched at them by Republicans and um, neoconservatives. Um, and I think today's hearing, which, you know, I, I, I know you didn't see it, um, but I think that there, you know, I, it's hard to say how the American public is going to view whether, who, who won, quote unquote, um, in those hearing standoffs um, and w whether Hegel will be seen as having positively uh, defended himself uh, against these charges brought by, you know, Senator Inhofe or Senator Cruz um, or any of the others. Uh, and so I think that we haven't, we haven't gotten there yet. I think we've, we've, we've continued in this Hegel hearing, we've continued to see that that became the dominant issue. The dominant issue, I mean, he did get asked questions that pertain to what the Secretary of Defense actually does, because of course the <laughs> Secretary of Defense doesn't negotiate, you know, if that's, that's going to be John Kerry's job, you know, to, to deal with this issue. It's not going to be, if Chuck Hagel becomes Defense Secretary, this is not going to be part of his, part of his dossier. Uh, and he, you know, I think he tried to say all the right things, you know, he said that, you know, we, okay, we stand with Israel, we're going to continue to fund Iron Dome for them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I think just the atmospherics created by these questions that were being addressed to him on these, are you, are you really pro-Israel enough? And really, you know, maybe we should be questioning your loyalty. Uh, prove that, you know, Washington hasn't moved beyond that yet. And because the media likes those kind of fireworks, because it's fun to report on and it's, you know, and you know more and interesting than more interesting like, than discussing you know missile systems and whether they're going to continue to fund those or not or the right. Pentagon budget or whatever. Um, you know, there's going to continue to be an appetite for that, and I think the Republicans see that there's an appetite for that in their base. I mean, you saw this week John Hagee and Christians United for Israel. I mean, I know that you know APEC set out this one, and there were a lot of Jewish uh, advocacy groups that sat it out and didn't take a position and weren't going to the Hill to talk to the senators about, about Hagel, but Hagee brought a few hundred pastors to Capitol Hill to talk to senators about Hagel. And so when you think about that, that's who they were listening to and that's who they were being, trying to be persuaded, who were, who were trying to persuade them that Hagel had some questionable bona fides on Israel. Uh, you know, it just, I think it just goes to show you that a, you know, we don't really, we, we don't, we really haven't, you know, moved out of that box very far, if at all. Well, I, I think that you just described the move. If APAC decided to sit this out, then a, a normally very feisty organization decided that this was a uh, fight that was either not justified or not winnable. And either way that that's... We're not worth it if Hegel became... If right. Okay. Was otherwise One way or another, they, the, the, the strategists within APAC and within other organizations uh, decided not to do this. So who, I mean, if you're a Democratic senator, if you're part of the, the Senate majority, um, John Hagee isn't voting for you anyway, right? Oh, yeah, that's, that's so, true. So, okay, I mean, you know, in other words, like, it, it I don't know, uh, People are talking about, uh, you know, a lot of other issues within the um, American political frame where those people also aren't voting for you. Um, you know, Texas is not, did not vote, you know, Democratic in the last presidential election. 
So if it, the effect of, of this vote is to produce the curious effect that that kind of pro-Israel stand gets identified as being equivalent to, uh, I don't know, John Hagee, um, uh, the last uh, battle against, uh, against gay marriage, I don't know what else, you know, the agenda of uh, the theocons, then that actually frees up a lot of people to say, okay, well, you know, they're not going to vote for us anyway, so we might as well move ahead. Well, I do think, though, um, you know, there is a lot of uh, what we call dark money, you know, money from unknown sources uh, being poured into, uh, you know, these ad campaigns and so on, which really don't influence individual voters, really. People don't really pay attention to them, but they're, they're meant to serve as a warning to senators. I think that in terms that of political... Sheldon Adelson, who decided November's election right. I mean, I think in the there's United some questions. States... <laughs> January's yes, elections yes, in Israel yes. might be out to get you. Yes. Or, I mean, at this point, it seems like a winning combination. Well, for, for but, to be still, but, still, your but still, but still, I think that, I think that APAC is more politically savvy than KUFI. Because I think that an organization like KUFI wins by losing. Okay? They win even when they lose. Because when they, if they lose, they can still have their complex about, you know, oh, you know, it's us against the world that doesn't care about Israel the way that we do. Right. APAC is much more, uh, as I said, savvy, smart, more of a Washington insider. Um, you know, they're about politics. Kufi likes to say it's about politics, but it's really about theology. Um, and so... I think that he that Hagee and Kufi don't really see that they have anything to lose if they pour all this effort into opposing Hegel and he still gets confirmed. I think that APAC would view that as an embarrassment to have waded into that fight and then he gets confirmed anyway. And so I think that that had a lot that has a lot to do with it. And but I still think that there's a lot of that stuff under the surface. And I think you, when you see Democratic senators from, uh, you know more heavily Jewish states like Senator Gilbrand uh, today, um, you see that there's still that concern about, you know, I, I need to ask Chuck Hagel about his quote unquote pro-Israel bona fides. Uh, look, I, I'm not saying that this issue has gone away, but I, I think that, that the combination of the fact that um, uh, in this particular fight, uh, some of the key groups decided it was politically wise to stay out. And the fact that even while Netanyahu remains prime minister, he's clearly politically weakened. Mm -hmm. um, it are things that, you know, are openings. Uh, there are openings in terms of the American political scene, and there are openings in terms of diplomacy. Uh, yeah, I don't, know, I don't, I don't disagree, uh, but Benjamin I think... Netanyahu is not king. He is, or if he is... <laughs> He's, uh, you know, he's a king of a collapsing kingdom in terms right. of his political situation. Mm -hmm. um, so attuning, you know, your political stance to the fact that you have to cure for, for Benjamin Netanyahu isn't even a smart move because you don't know how long he's going to be around and, he, and he's power sharing now. So... Look, I'm not saying that this, you know, that this uh, pressure isn't there in Washington, and I'm not uh, seeking to explain Washington. Right. Um, I'm saying that that the potential for engaging in such efforts now is greater than when Netanyahu had a more solid majority in the Knesset, and wasn't seen as a loser by everybody, including most members of his own party. Right. So, you know, I will they test it? I don't know. I mean... Well... You know, I, I wouldn't have thought that anybody would have tested, you know, gun control. Right? So, who knows? Yeah, no, I mean, I do have to say that Obama has been surprisingly oh, out front on the on the gun control 
uh, issue and uh, on the immigration issue, another you know highly contested issue here in the states. Um, and he, I think you know he's he's. He had, at least so far has up. appeared as it has appeared willing to really fight the fight. So, but you know, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's a shame that he can't recommend. I mean, I understand that he can't because it's impossible. It's politically beyond hope. But it's a shame he can't suggest Israel's gun laws because then only about I don't know some tiny fraction of, of, of Americans would be eligible for gun licenses. Uh, but okay, that's another daydream for another time. Right. Um, uh, but he has been he has been feistier since uh, since November. So um, I'm not saying that I'm betting on something happening from Washington. Kerry claimed that there would be something without saying quite what. Right. Uh, we'll see. I you know the, the question is what would happen if he tried it. I think conditions are better. Right. Right. Well, I think. Uh... The takeaway of don't despair is a pretty good note to end on. Okay. So, okay. Um, thank you, Sarah. Well, thank you so much for doing it. It was a good discussion.